Welcome to the New Chemist Podcast. We're so glad you're listening. Feel free to download this podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Odyssey, Stitcher, and a variety of other platforms. Here on the New Chemist, we discuss chemistry, which simply put is a science of change, as well as other sciences, careers, community research, and other lectures in chemistry, and we analyze those lectures as well. My guest today is Dr. Campo. It is so good to have him as a guest today. He is the Associate Vice President and Head of Small Molecule Research and Development at Merck, a very established and accomplished scientist having received numerous citations, patents, and multiple awards. He is currently a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. It's definitely a treat and an honor to have him as a guest today. Okay, so Dr. Campo, let's begin. Um, what have been your long-standing interests in the field of science? So ever since I was a young kid, I was uh, interested in sort of how things work. Um, you know, asking tons of questions, trying to understand how the world works. I was also always interested in building things. I was one of those, you know, obsessed with Lego kids. Oh, yeah. And um, in high school, I became really interested in sort of the biochemistry through one of my biology teachers who was sort of explaining how cells work and ultimately the chemistry of cells. And I became, or at least at the time, I thought I was really interested in biology and I decided to pursue uh, undergraduate studies in biopharmaceutical sciences. But I would say that I um, probably um, didn't realize that what I really liked about that high school biology class was actually the organic chemistry part of it. And I realized this um, when I was a second year graduate student uh, second year undergraduate student, sorry, in organic chemistry um, in a class taught by Professor Louis Berrio at the University of Ottawa. And he really ignited something within me in terms of my interest in organic chemistry and the chemistry of carbon and sort of how you stitch these molecules together um, and sort of started to introduce the concept of how these molecules could have an impact um, on the world. And ultimately, um, I decided to pursue graduate studies um, in large part because of my interest um, in, in organic chemistry and I did a PhD in catalysis where I studied how uh, late transition metals can um, catalyze reactions that would otherwise be impossible and oh, yeah. chemistry of palladium and through that work I became interested in sort of mechanistic understanding and the details of how reactions work and oh, yeah. ultimately uh, what happened was I, I realized that um, you know through through an acquaintance of mine someone in my network learned you know what process chemists do and found that it was a phenomenal way to apply my strengths and things that I was really interested in to a problem that could have a really big impact on the world and, and ultimately decided to join Merck as a process chemist a little over 15 years ago. Okay, yeah. So how do you maintain vision and teamwork in your environment and your work environment at Merck as you work on these research projects? How are you maintaining the big ideas, the big picture uh, ideals of vision and teamwork? How do you maintain those? So one of the things that I always found was really important um, is to uh, link our work to the purpose that it is we're trying uh, to, yeah, yeah. to accomplish. And yeah, I think yeah. we have sort of a such a privileged position, um, you know, as scientists in pharma to be able to link the work that we do to ultimately improving human health. Like we're literally changing the world one reaction at a time. Um, oh, and wow. you know, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> and and there, there there aren't a lot of necessarily jobs out there where you can directly link what you do um, uh, to a purpose. And I think that's a really important thing that I try to reinforce with my team. But I also think it's important to have broad interests. And so I think as scientists, it's it's really it's really easy to get into this tiny little uber specific area of expertise, um, which is how the world works uh, for science. But I've always thought. It's really important to have broad interests. And I think for pharmaceutical development, again, because there are so many disciplines uh, that have to come to bear to bring a drug to market, that's another way for me to sort of think about the bigger picture is understanding what the biologists are doing and understanding what the chemical engineers in my team are doing or understanding how medicinal chemists design molecules and ultimately how our manufacturing colleagues are going to have to, to, to utilize the chemistry that we put in place and our, and our drug product colleagues that have to formulate the drug. So it's, um, it's a tremendous privilege, I would say, for us to have that purpose, but also to have that opportunity to get that really broad um, you know, set of stakeholders. And the last thing I'll say is um, 
because we're still doing cutting edge chemistry, we're very well connected and, and continue to contribute to the academic community as well. Oh, and that's okay. another way to sort of broaden uh, your interests and get the big picture. Okay, wow, that's good, that's good. So what, if, you had, if you were advising or giving suggestions to someone who wanted to work in the same role that you're working in as someone who deals with small molecule research and development, what would you say would be the toolkit or the degree that would give you the best chance of getting an opportunity to work at Merck? So I think there's so many disciplines at Merck that contribute to developing small molecules, not to mention all the biologics and vaccines that we develop as well. That, that I think I think there isn't like a single discipline or a single degree, um, mm -hmm. you know, specifically for my career path and, and being a process chemist, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, advanced degree in synthetic organic chemistry was uh, definitely uh, a good way for me to get entry into into the field. We hire a lot of chemists that um, we hire to solve really difficult problems. Um, most yeah. of them have graduate degrees, PhDs or, or masters, mm -hmm. um, but we also hire chemical engineers. Um, we hire analytical scientists. Um, some of our specialty groups have um, other disciplines like uh, protein engineers or Okay. Uh, people who have experience in, in other types of engineering. So it's pretty broad. Um, the biggest uh, biggest impact or, or I guess biggest opportunity to come to a place like Merck is really to leverage the network that you build throughout your studies, right? Whether it's through your undergraduate institution or through a graduate advisor and really get to know people that work in the area that you're interested in. And then you'll really know what it's like to work there. And first, you'll know if it's a good fit for you. But the second, that can open doors to get the opportunity to interview Okay, yeah, that's good, that's good. So what would you say has been your most creative piece of work in the field of science, specifically on what you work on? And you can be mm. as technical or as simple as you want to be. Um, what would you say has been your most creative piece of work? Is it an elegant bond disconnection? Or, um... <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, the longer you are in the job that I am, the less close to the science you are. But oh, if I go okay. all the way back, so what I would say is um, there's maybe a couple things. So maybe I'll split it by my graduate work versus my work at Merck. So when I was a graduate student, um, I had an insight that um, a certain type of electronic effect in the molecules that I was studying could be exploited to make a carbon carbon bond that hadn't been known before and okay. and that eventually that that seed of an idea eventually became what we now call concerted methylation deprotonation which is a a, a well accepted mechanism okay. in uh, palladium catalyzed um direct aerylation reactions and it was you know i was 24 years old i had this idea that you know CH acidity was going to be an important factor in these reactions and that electron deficient arenes should work, which was not known at the time. And ultimately that ended up working and my whole PhD ended up being about that. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of that work. I would say if, if I have to pick one thing that I'm the most proud of at Merck so far, there are two projects on which I made really important contributions. Uh, one of them is Durabarine, which is a, an approved drug for HIV treatment where I was able to design a synthesis of that molecule to really um, rapidly and quickly bring it into preclinical and clinical studies. And, and ultimately that drug was approved. And so I'm really proud of that. And then more recently, I actually led a cross-functional team that um, developed um, a cardiovascular drug that you know isn't on the market yet, so I can't really talk about it, but it was um, a cholesterol medication that's now going into phase three at Merck. And uh, it was one of the first uh, macroscopic peptides that Merck um, synthesized and ultimately brought to market. And our team had to develop a bunch of extremely novel chemistry in order to be able to do that. So I can't wait to be able to tell the world about that in a couple of years. Okay, that sounds really good. It's interesting that you worked on a, on a HIV drug, you said, an HIV drug? Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, that's interesting because one of my mentors, I don't know if you're familiar with the name, Lou Jungheim. Mm hmm Yeah, who worked on Nilpinavir. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, so nice. yeah, yeah, it's definitely, definitely interesting. It's interesting connection, <laughs> interesting conversation. So, small world. Uh, yeah, small world in a way. Um, so how have you sought or found the right environment for you to thrive scientifically and intellectually? How did you go about finding Merck or did Merck find you? What process yeah. do you use to find this um, job or find this role or progress in your career? So, so I, I think I would be 
kidding myself if I didn't think there's a tremendous amount of luck that goes into these types of things, right? So yeah, serendipity. I was I was a undergrad at the University of Ottawa. Um, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do long term, but I knew that I really loved organic chemistry and that I wanted to do something there. A friend of mine, um, who was a lab, who who was uh, sort of my lab partner, was like, "Hey, I'm going to go to grad school and I'm going to work with this guy." Keith Fan, you, you just started like this month. He's a brand new prof, but he's really cool and I want to work with him. So I went to meet with Keith and I said, hey, I think I want to go to grad school too. Like I hadn't really thought this through yet. And we talked for about an hour and there's like a spark, you know, like you meet these people and you're yeah. just like, wow, this person's awesome. I want to just spend time with this person. It's going to be great. <laughs> so, you know, he didn't have a lab. He didn't have, like, I didn't know anything about him. Um, he was a tremendously successful graduate student, but at the time I wasn't like in the know, right? So I joined this guy's lab and it ended up being, you know, maybe the best four years uh, professionally, you know, like it, it was just an, an amazing experience uh, to work with him as a mentor. And through him, I learned a lot about pharmaceutical science and sort of like the different places that people do process chemistry and med chem and what's the difference. And one of his close friends was a process chemist at Merck and he would invite him every year to come and speak at the university and speak to the group. Um, and so this guy, Greg Hughes, um, used to come and give these scientific talks like this is what we do and this is the impact that we have. And I was always tremendously inspired by that. And I met him and we eventually built a relationship. And so, you know, four years later or three and a half years later, when there was a position at Merck, he actually called and said, hey, there's a position. You should apply for it um, so that we can interview you and see if you're a good fit to come here. So, you know, if you think about that progression that I just walked you through like I didn't talk about my accomplishments I didn't talk about you know like obviously you got to deliver the science but if I hadn't been in Keith's lab and if Keith's best friend hadn't been a process chemist at Merck I, I doubt that I would have had the opportunity to interview and I think sometimes we just have to lean into that um, that you know chance matters and so that's why you need to know as many people as possible and you need to kind of cultivate that network because I think it's really important yeah, but then once you interview you know I always tell people when you interview at a place you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. I agree. You you become the people that you work with. And so when you're interviewing there, if you meet people that you're like, wow, I hope one day I can do what that person does, then mm -hmm. that's a great fit. And that's how I felt when I interviewed at Merck. I knew that I wanted to be a process chemist at Merck as soon as I met the people that worked there, the way that they thought about problems, the way they were really passionate about the impact they could have. Mm -hmm. and And that has been true. And it's been true for the last 15 years, which is why I'm still here. Wow. Wow, that's good. That's good. Wow, that's good. So, uh, what would you say has come from your success so far? Yes, you said there's a degree of serendipity or chance, or whatever you want to phrase it. Who would you say has been one of your driving encouragers, motivators, mm. uh, inspire, inspire, source of inspiration? What would you say has come from your success? Can you mm. name some of the people or talk about the people who really played a role outside of the ones you mentioned already? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I would say there's, I, I like I like sort of your line of questioning here. Like, I think the people really matter. I think your mindset matters a lot as well. Yeah. So yeah. I've always been fascinated by ideas. Um, I'm sort of creative by nature. I like, I'm excited by new ideas and the prospect of doing something new. Okay. And and I have a, probably more of an optimistic bend than a, than a, than a pessimistic bend. And, and okay. scientists who are listening to this will know, like you, you bring a new idea to someone and one person will say, well, that's definitely not going to work. You shouldn't do that. And then another person will say, wow, that's really cool. You should try that, you know? And I've surrounded myself with people that are more on that side of the spectrum, you know, like okay. people that are going to cheer you on when you have a cool idea that you want to try. And, mm -hmm. and I would say, you know, I already talked about, about Keith and about Greg, but when I was at Frost, my one of my first mentors there was uh, a guy named Stefan Willette and a, and a woman called Sarah Dolman. And they had been there three or four years, so they kind of knew the ropes, but they were really good at sort of encouraging me to try my ideas. I had a peer that just started at the time, this guy um, named Ernest Lee, who's now at Gilead. And I remember going into his office with a crazy idea and I drew it on the board and I was like, do you think this is gonna work? Cause nobody else thinks it's gonna work. He's like, that's the coolest thing ever. You should try it. And then I went and I tried it and it worked. And it was like, I probably, wow. if he'd have said no, he'd have been like the fifth person to tell me no. And then I probably would have said, okay, I'm not gonna try this. And Keith wow. used to say, 
You have to think of an idea long enough to convince yourself to try it, but not too long to convince yourself that it won't work. And I think that that's tremendous advice. Um, I've had other mentors like that. You know, when I, when I first moved to the US, I worked very closely with uh, a mentor of mine who's still actually still my boss, Kevin Campos, who was the same way. Um, I have a peer right now, another associate vice president, Becky Ruck and I, that I've worked together for over 10 years and, and she's like that too. So there's oh. kind of this element of people that surround you that, that sort of um, ultimately make you better. And that, that's the only advice I'll leave you for this question is I feel like I've thought a lot about how I can make others around me better. And ultimately that makes me better too. And then we're all better for it. Um, and yeah. I think that's really important. Yeah, I agree, I agree. You bring value to the space that you're in and that value, yeah, yeah it, adds, it adds to you and to the others as well. Yeah, that's good. So how do you maintain a balanced life given all your responsibilities and accomplishments? <laughs> uh, or let's phrase it differently. How do you maintain your priorities? How do you keep your priorities in sure. check? How is your work-life integration? Um, how do you maintain a sense of resilience when you face obstacles? We could all, we could phrase this, spin this question yeah. in a different way. No, I like what you said. I, I like I like what you said. Work life integration or work life fit. I I I, I don't believe in work life balance. I, I think balance um, implies that some of it is bad and some of it is good. Um, fit is about making sure that you get the most out of how you spend your time, regardless of whether that's work or not work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What I would say is. Um, you know, this evolves over time and as, as your responsibilities increase, this becomes more and more challenging. One of the things that um, I always tell people in my group is you have to have very clear boundaries for certain things. And for me, like I'll give you an example, really early on when I had a very small family, when my, my wife and I first got together and, and ultimately when we had our son, having dinner together every night was really important. And so there was mm -hmm. never going to be a time where... Um, I would stay late at the lab just because I could and skip dinner or miss dinner with my family. And so, you know, I'm the kind of person that leaves work so that I can get home and have dinner with my family. It doesn't mean that sometimes I don't get back on my computer later or, you know, when I was a graduate student, I'd go back to the lab um, after dinner. But that was sort of one of the imperative things that I wanted to do. Um, and of course, things get in the way of that, like travel and whatever. But, you know, it was one of those things. And I think over time, I got really good um, at figuring out what were those things that were really important to me, either because they brought me strength, they brought me joy, they um, helped me, you know, sustain my passion. And those could be things that are within work as well. So I always tell people like, find those things at work that you're really good at and that bring you a lot of energy and make sure you do a little bit of that every day because yeah. you could have a day filled with stuff that you're really not interested in on, for whatever reason that particular day or it's a task that you're not particularly excited but yeah. if you can find an hour or two in that day where you're going to do something that you're really passionate about that you're really excited about that's what's ultimately sustain you over time um, and then you just got to be ruthless with your prioritization. And so you have to, to weed out the things that, um, that really don't drive a value proposition for you, whether that's a professional oh, yeah. value proposition or a personal yeah, yeah, value yeah, proposition, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, and I would say that again, I always tell people in my team, like you're going to be asked, uh, to spend time on all kinds of things. And when people ask, they don't necessarily have the complete picture of what your day looks like or what your life looks like. And it's I okay agree. to say no. Right. Okay. So spend the time on things that you're really good at and that drive a value proposition for whatever it is you're doing at, the, at that time, whether mm -hmm. that's a company or whether that's your home life. Mm -hmm. And then be ruthless in your prioritization and just start cutting things out to create space for that. And I would say that um, that's been tremendously successful for me. Um, I'm actually able to get more done in less time because I don't spend time on things that don't necessarily drive a lot of value, you know. Yeah, and that's really important. Yeah, that's very, that's very good, and that's the same reason. That's the same reason why I enjoy podcasting so much and enjoy having these conversations as well as um, assisting with science education in the community that I serve in and serving as faculty. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You summed it up well. So you also have a podcast, Farm to Table Podcast. So yes. uh, my question to you is, what led to you starting that? Uh, what what has been the how do you find time for all of this dr campo <laughs> uh, you have a family you have a big job you have a, a high-ranking job that's a lot of responsibilities and you also have a podcast as well to put the icing on the cake so how do you <laughs> how do you how are you able to do all of this so, so tell us 
this is this is actually a great segue, David, because we were just talking about like finding things in your life that bring you joy, joy and dedicate time to it, right? And one of my strengths is communication. Like I get a lot of energy out of meeting new people, out of talking about stuff with people. Um, like if I have a day full of meetings where I'm meeting people one on one, I'll be really energized at the end of the day. Whereas if I have a day where I have to sit in my office and work on a document for five or six hours straight or write a paper, or like I'm not interfacing with people, I'm completely drained of energy. And I realized this somewhere about 10 years ago, I sort of did a Clifton Strength Finder assessment and communication was number one. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And I realized that some of our strengths are also needs. Right. So if you're really good at something, you're you probably need some of that in your life. And so I started thinking about ways that I could apply my strengths to things that would drive value for our company. Right. And oh, yeah. for my job. Oh, yeah. So one of those things was, well, OK, we have this audience, right, that we speak to at conferences when we visit schools that ultimately ends up being the recruiting pool for our talent. Right. Graduate students at universities. But there's an infinite number of universities and an infinite number of graduate students. We can't reach them all. And in 2019, I was at a conference and there was a speaker there, Randy Zuckerberg, who's actually Mark Zuckerberg's sister. And she's a marketing expert. And she says, like, you know, podcasting is really taken off in the last few years. But there's this sort of gap for subject matter expert podcasts for like, you know, if you're an organic synthetic chemist and you want to talk about organic synthetic chemistry, there's probably not a podcast, a lot of podcasts about that. And I sort of had that on the back of my mind, like, hey, maybe uh -huh. we could do that. It would play to my strengths. It could allow us to reach an audience. And then the pandemic happened, right? Mm -hmm. And then we all got sent home. We had um, a bunch of interns that were coming for the summer, which usually would work in our laboratories, but we, we weren't going to be able to do that during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ideas we had was to start a podcast and work with an intern to sort of pilot what that would look like and have them do some of the editing and sort of lead the effort. But, you know, I would be the host and started reading about podcasting and sort of decided that having a, you know, a co-host in my case was going to be the right fit for me. And so I, I approached Danny Schultz, who's a member of my team. And I was like, hey, you know, I love talking to you all the time. We always have great conversations. Why don't we record them? And okay. that could be a podcast. Yeah. And so we started messing around with that in 2020 and we weren't good at it at first. <laughs> you yeah. know, like we sort of, you I have, have that, the, growing pains. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the growing pains, right? Yeah. Uh, but the, the general idea of that podcast is we pick a paper, usually a recent paper that our team has published. And we sit down with the key, you know, either one or two of the scientists that contributed to that paper. And we try to get to the stories behind the paper. Like, you know, why did you do this work? And yeah. what are the, th why, how does it link to what we do? And, and why is it important? You know, cause when you read a paper, some of that stuff isn't necessarily written in there. So it's, it's a cool way for, let's say a graduate student to learn a little bit more about how we work. It's yeah. a great way for them to learn about the people that are in our organization that they may otherwise not get to meet or hear about. Uh -huh. And so we launched um, summer 2021, so about a year after we started messing around with this as a side project. Um, and then I think we, we found kind of our cadence. So like, like you do here, we have somewhat of a structure of, you know, that we help people with preparing. We usually use a slide deck. Um, and so, you know, four or five slides just to kind of help uh, anchor everyone. Um, and then we tend to record in blocks. So we'll, we'll schedule, let's say four or five, you know, episodes worth of guests in a morning and we'll do it all in one shot. And then we spend the next like three or four months working on the editing and the, and the production to get it out the door. So if you think about it, we, we usually have about, you know, 10 to 12 episodes a year. Um, and so that's basically three half days worth of recording. Um, and then, and then after that, it's just sort of the, you know, a few, a few hours here and there to get everything buttoned up and launched. And so it ends up being not like a ton of work. Um, but it, it is extra work. It's not like something I got to do for my job. We just decided to do it, mm -hmm. but it ended up driving tremendous value. Like pretty much everybody who comes and in interviews at Merck now says, Hey, like I heard the podcast and I learned about this paper that I probably yeah. wouldn't learn about any other way. So yeah. it ended up being exactly what we wanted. But this all started from a place where I was like, I'm a really good communicator. I like talking to people. Mm -hmm. And if I could apply those skills to something that would drive value for my organization, that would be great. And then the pandemic happened and the intern thing lined up and we just did it. So it, yeah. it, it's an example of sort of my philosophy in action, if you will. 
Yeah, I completely agree. And same thing with me. Like the podcast, my podcast started in August 2020. Here you right, go. Yeah, right when the pandemic started. It's amazing how the pandemic spurred creativity for many people. And then Absolutely. also, I had the opportunity to interview people like the co founder of Moderna, like professors at Harvard, the Broad Institute, like a variety of people, a Dr. Campo. By the way, <laughs> so, <laughs> I've had a lot. I've had a lot of opportunity to meet people and engage in meaningful dialogue. And that whole, the whole basis and structure of the podcast came from a book, Find Your Path, um, which is published by MIT Press. In terms of yeah. me reading through that and adapting the same method of inquiry for um, mm. the podcast. So, um, as we conclude, um, what? advice would you give to those wanting to pursue the field you're currently working in what would you tell someone if they came to you and said i want to do what you're doing in the next 15 years or i want to <laughs> help the world in a similar way in the next 15 years yeah how, how should i start what would you tell an undergrad what would you tell a grad student yeah so i think i, I would i would encourage um undergrads to make sure that they have a passion for the science um, because being a graduate student is difficult <laughs> right there's a ton of failure um and sometimes sometimes you wonder like why did i decide to do this it seems like i'm working a lot and i'm not making a lot of progress but being a graduate student is all about overcoming that right it's about yeah. learning how to solve problems and realizing that you know you don't go from point a to point b directly that sometimes you have to take massive detours and you have to be curious about the world and you have to be curious about your science. And if that, if you feel like you have that, then you should go to grad school. If, if you want to go to grad school just to get a job later, but you're not sure you're going to enjoy the process of struggling through the science, that, that doesn't set you up for success. So I would, it needs to start from a place of genuine interest in wanting to understand some problem, some yeah. scientific problem, and then you go to I grad agree. school. I agree, I agree. And then the vast majority of pharma scientists, um, you know, have some sort of graduate degree, and and, and most, at least in, in 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 chemistry groups, have PhDs. And then I think if you really want to take the next step into um, a pharma career in chemistry, um, then that really comes down to developing um, the network while you're in grad school. So many schools will have pharmaceutical scientists that visit on a regular basis, mm -hmm. meeting those people, telling them about your accomplishments and your um, and your science um, so that when and if there's a job opening, you're sort of on their list of people they would want to interview. Because the hard part is getting the interview. After that, it's all on you. You know what I mean? It's all yeah. about your accomplishments and how how you're going to make others around you better and how what you're going to bring to that organization. But there's, again, an infinite number of people in an infinite number of locations. And so finding the right people to, to, to bring in for an interview can sometimes be challenging. Um, but I always tell people when I was a graduate student, um, Greg Hughes is one of my mentors. He, he was visiting and someone was like, well, what do I got to do as a graduate student to get a job at Merck? <laughs> and he replied, well, you just got to be awesome, which I thought was a really funny question. But his point was that when you interview, you're going to have to convince a group of people that you're the kind of person that's going to solve the most challenging problems that um, this company has on the table. And um, so we look for people that are great at solving problems. It's not like we look for sub-disciplines of expertise, like that happens every once in a while. But generally speaking, scientists are extremely adaptable. And so if you're really good at learning something new and applying it in a way to solve problems, when you come here, we're going to teach you a bunch of new stuff and you're going to solve a bunch of problems. And so that's that's what I tell people they need to be able to demonstrate in your interviews. Okay, well, that's good. It sounds like you are definitely moving forward and making lots of progress. And in my opinion, achieving your lambda marks. So reaching a point where you can transition from one energy state to another or one level to another and make an impact or gain the maximum from your environment. Yes, that is what I would say. So what has been some of the most beneficial advice you have received, either from your parents or professors or um, yeah. family members or significant other? What would you say something that replays in your mind when you like really succeed and do tremendous and bring yeah. you back down in terms of humility. So uh, <laughs> it really helps yeah. you to pick yourself so, up from those rough days. Yeah, I feel like, I, I feel like, I, I don't know if you want to put this in the category of advice, but I had a French literature teacher in, when I was in high school, we were reading this really old piece of French literature and he was really excited about this one passage. And the passage went, um, in French, à vaincre sans péril, en triomphe sans gloire, which basically means like to be victorious without peril is to triumph without glory. And for whatever reason, so here I am, 16, 17 years old, I hear this for the first time. But this idea that 
you know, you're going to, when you succeed, you're going to look back on those tough moments and realize oh, yeah. that, that having overcome that will only augment what you ultimately accomplished. It, mm -hmm. that sense, that, 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 that one line, which is like from whatever 16th century French literature, um, was really like, it, it makes the, 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 the tough times harder, uh, easier to get through because you're sort of like, yeah, it's really tough right now. I'm trying to solve this problem and I don't know if I can solve it, but when I solve it, this is going to be so much greater. And I used to walk around the labs when I was a grad student and walk around the labs at Merck. And I used to tell people this quote, you know, like when they were like struggling with something and I'm like, when you solve this problem, this is going to be even greater, right? Uh -huh. Because you'll have overcome this adversity. And it, and it reminds me of a quote that I recently heard in a movie about the, the guy who invented the Lamborghini. And he says, it isn't impossible until we fail. And if we fail, we'll fail searching for greatness. So it's kind of this similar, similar vein of like, I just assume that we're going to get to the right place at the end. And that mindset is really important. It's important for scientists because most experiments that we run will fail, right? Yes. Um, but ultimately, as a collective, as a group of scientists that come together to solve these problems in drug discovery and development, we often succeed in the end um, as a group, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's probably, you know, it's not really advice because it came from like a, a book. Um, I already told you about about Keith's quote about mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. not 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 convincing yourself not to do stuff. That's something I repeat all the time as well. Yeah. But to me, those two things are probably the most important things that I think um, people should take away from from this conversation. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I remember this book, Good Timber. As we conclude, remember this um, quote from Good Timber. This poem. Um, it said, "The tree that never had to fight for sun and sky and air and light, but stood out in the open plain and always got its share of rain." never became a forest king but lived and died a scrubby thing the man who never <laughs> had to toil to gain in farmer's patch of soil who never had to win his share of sun and sky and light and air never became a manly man but lived and died as he began good timber does not grow in ease the stronger winds the stronger trees the further the sky the greater the length the more the storm the more the strength by sun and cold by rain and snow in tree and men good timbers grow so yeah, do yeah, oh, Dr. Campo. Yeah, yeah, I said that in high school and it still replays <laughs> in my mind. Yeah, as, as well as my face perspective and face tradition. But yeah, Dr. Campo, it's so good to have you as a guest. It was a privilege and a honor.